Joe in here? There he is. <laughs> Joe's one of the, the world experts on how, how am I doing so far? What have I got? Uh, 90%. 90%. <laughs> well, there's, there's an old thing in the. <laughs> it's really what, 60? <laughs> so there's, a, there's an old thing in mining called salting a mine. You salt your mine claim. When you run out of capital, and you're convinced that there's some gold down there somewhere, but you just need some more investment cash, you might salt the mine, which means you throw in some, something valuable to say, oh look, we got these links of gold chain out of the Oak Island money pit. None of that stuff came out of the pit. The result is not only tens of millions of dollars being wasted, but uh, at least six lives have been lost in the money pit over 200 years. This is another example of wasted resources based on faulty assumptions. This is one of many proposed ideas to clean up the garbage out of the Pacific garbage patch. The assumption being that there's enough garbage that this boat with uh, these booms on it can collect it densely enough that it can then use it and burn it for fuel. Now if you built this you would run out of fuel very quickly because although there are tiny particles of plastic floating there is not a solid island of trash. There is not anything like anything near like what you see here in this picture. I'm not sure if you can see it, but this picture illustrates a fairly common amount of garbage floating in the water in, in front of this boat. Uh, it's simply not true. And this is something that I write on fairly regularly. A couple of times a year I'll check back. And um, you know, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they keep on top of this. And they go out there and they're testing the water all the time. And they're looking for how much concentration. And right now in the, in the densest part of the Pacific gyre we've got uh, one particle of plastic every 30 to 90 square meters. It's about the size of a tennis court. One particle, it's these little tiny, looks like a piece of pepper, like you're shaking pepper on the surface of the water. I'm not saying that's good, but it's not this. It's not worthy about spending huge amounts of money to build boats that can't possibly do anything. And nevertheless, especially because it's such a hot Topic from a politically correct standpoint and an environmental standpoint, there's a lot of interest in cleaning up the Pacific garbage patch. And virtually all that money is going to be wasted based on faulty assumptions. Oh boy, multi level marketing. How many of us know someone who is fairly well convinced that they're going to become a millionaire? The assumption is that multi level marketing companies are a great way to make money owning your own business. Hey, the fact is that despite these sales pitches and showing you these mathematical pyramids and everything proving that it's a certainty that you're going to make money, um, the, the simple fact, simple, simple math and game theory prove that it's impossible for these things to work. Um, <coughs> if, you, if your business depends on recruiting people to compete with you, you're not going to be successful in business. And we know by simple math, uh, by running 5 to the 14th power, that if just in just one of these companies in all of history, if they ever had a line of distributors just 14 people deep, that alone would require more people than have ever existed. So, no, these don't work and you're not going to make money. And the result, based on this faulty assumption, 99.95% of multi-level marketers lose money. However, my advice is that if you want to spend money on this, instead go to Las Vegas, because only 97.14% of money is lost playing roulette. <laughs> go to Vegas, put all your money on roulette, you will do better than you will in a multi-level marketing scheme. Uh, this is another one that I love because I always get a lot of arguments on this one. Does anyone recognize this place? It is the Nevada test site where they did all of these underground nuclear tests. Um, all of those craters, those are above an underground cavern that was created by an underground nuclear blast. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and what everyone tends to assume is that the downwinders, which is the name we give to people mostly living in the St. George, Utah area, the downwinders, we assume that they're more likely to have cancer and to deserve compensation. Well, the fact is that now, 60 years later after doing this, we have very good data and there is no correlation at all between elevated cancer and having lived downwind of the nuclear tests, which surprises people, uh, but it is true. Um, 
The result is that $1.5 billion in payments have been made to people that basically didn't, didn't do anything to, to deserve that. They didn't die horribly of cancer to deserve a payment, so I'm mad at them. <laughs> It's, yeah, <laughs> thank you. There's our branding problem right there. It's me! So they, what, they, what the government did is they established a fund, and if you had a certain disease in a certain period of time when you lived in a certain area, you were, established, you were, you were entitled to a fixed payment of a certain amount. That way there was no lawsuits. It's kind of like the vaccine court. Simplified that and greased the whole process. Uh, anyone who follows my work closely knows that I follow this one uh, fairly close, closely. This is, of course, Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart. The assumption is that she made it to an island where she might still be found, because we have that shoved down our throat every single day by Nat Geo and Discovery Channel. Therefore, we should throw money and attention at, uh, at uh, expeditions to try and recover her skeleton. The fact is that, no, there's no truth to that at all. Uh, we do know where she went down with pretty good certainty, uh, she's in the deep drink, exactly where she was supposed to be. And the, the res, but the result of this bad assumption that the TV networks make is that they continue making 20, 20 years now of TV programming and these expensive expeditions, lost investor capital, all based on the press releases of one guy who's been promoting his crank theory for 20 years uh, with amazing success. I continue to be blown away by how successful this guy is. His most recent press release was about... Uh, the, the, the skeleton. Did anyone see that? It was maybe a month, two months ago. Um, the headline was, the skeleton might be hers after all. There was a partial skeleton was found on this guy's island. And now, now hundreds of people had lived on this island for hundreds of years, starting with pearl divers all the way through people in World War II. There was a Coast Guard um, station there. Uh, Britain had a colony <coughs> on this island. A lot of people and a lot of trash on this island. It's not really surprising that we might find a skeleton there. The skeleton was uh, very obviously that of a man. And yet this guy says, from looking at a couple of pictures of Amelia Earhart, it looked like she had unusually long forearms. Therefore, this skeleton was her. And if you paid attention, that story got promoted on every legitimate news outlet in the world. They, it was a, an abominable case of failure to do the slightest due diligence. So now let's talk about physical harm. When does bad assumptions actually cause physical harm to people? And this is our most familiar. This is, when I give this talk at universities, this is the age test. <laughs> because everyone knows Steve Jobs on the left. Some people know that guy in the middle, who is, of course, Steve McQueen. And nobody in college has any idea who that is, guy is on the right, Jim Henson. And of course, the bad assumption that all three of these guys made was that alternative medicine is a safe and effective alternative to real medical treatment. Um, the fact is they're completely useless. There's no need for me to go into this, uh, in, in, into this here. And the result is that people die. They get physical harm based on these bad assumptions. In a broader sense, uh, traditional Chinese medicine is something that uh, is relied upon heavily in China, right? Now that's, that's not right. <laughs> it's almost entirely a creation for Western New Age audiences. Um, yes, it did happen. It happened to, to a limited degree because it was the only way that, that Mao could provide something that looked like medical care for his remote villages that he couldn't afford to stock with pharmacies and hospitals. So the Barefoot Doctor program was established. And he gave the barefoot doctors, um, each per uh, one person from each village was the, the, was the basic plan, would be brought to a hospital and given a paramedical training, and they were given this manual called the Barefoot Doctor's Manual. This book was 900 pages long. When it was published in the United States in 1970, 600 of those 900 pages were cut out. The 600 pages containing the real medical information, leaving just the 300 pages of or you can use this herb if there's no medicine available. And that's what persuaded Western audiences that the Chinese rely entirely on alternative medicine. It was a fascinating case. Um, I got a copy of the, um, of when I did my episode on this, the podcast episode about the Barefoot Doctors, I got copies of both books and it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really blatant, it's really blatant. 
Well, of course, the result is now people believe, mostly Western people believe that Chinese traditional medicine is something that they can rely on when they get sick, and they die. There's your physical harm. Uh, someone asked yesterday, what is one of the great successes of, the, of, of skepticism? And this is one that, that I thought of right away, because a number of people in our community, uh, both in the United States and in the UK, were involved in busting these guys. And this is the, um, the uh, AE, ADE-651 bomb detector. If you, if you haven't heard of this, I'll give a quick rundown. Uh, this was sold mostly to Iraq by a company in the, in the UK. Uh, it's heavy, appears to be a very high quality device. Uh, it's empty, it just has a hinge on the front with this little extendable antenna. It's, it's a dowsing rod, it does nothing at all. There's no mechanism of any kind in it. Um, there's a cord going down and that goes to a little pouch on the guy's belt and you put, I think it's like a, like a, like a key card or something you put, it, you put into this and like here's the key card for bombs, I'm going to look for bombs today. Oh, here's the key card for water, I'm going to look for water today. When, uh, when torn down it was discovered that these things all contain a microchip which is just thrown into a hollow space inside the device and the microchips were anything, they were from a washing machine, from a refrigerator, just collected from junkyards. It's powered by, oh, remind me, who knows how it's powered? No, 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 uh, supposedly to, to power the device, uh, the, the, what their claim was. It was something like your static energy from your body or something like that. So, physical harm based on bad assumptions. Um, this guy in this company, he got thrown in jail and his company was put out of business. However, it was too little too late because there are dozens of copycat companies actively selling these still. Um, this one, Iraq spent $75 million buying these things um, and supposedly thinking that their bomb checkpoints are now safe, which they're not, obviously. 